Good afternoon. Um, venerable, dear Venerable, thank you very much for coming. Uh, dear friends and um, colleagues, we are very happy to um, have Dr. George Lee, um, who formerly was at the uh, co-department chair of the um, MFT psychology program at University of the West. Uh, he left US in 2016, and finally, we we're able to invite him to come back uh, to give this talk. Um, Professor Lee is currently the uh, faculty member at University of Hong Kong. Uh, and he has his uh, doctorate in um, Buddhist study, religious study, Buddhist study. And also um, a doctorate in psychology. And he also a licensed in the state of California. Um, so we are very honored uh, to have someone who have the expertise in both fields to share with us um, how Buddhist wisdom um, related to uh, mental health in, in general. Um, so uh, I think it's be an intriguing topic and particularly relevant um, to this area and in California or even uh, internationally nowadays, the concept of psychology are more acceptable um, from the uh, Western perspective. Um, so I think this topic is at the perfect time after the three long years of pandemic. And we know how it have impacts um, so many people uh, stay of mind. Um, so, and on top of that, we're very fortunate uh, to have um, Dr. Derek Stay, uh, who's a program head of the Asian American Pacific American Mental Health Program in specifically uh, Long Beach. Um, so, uh, who uh, is uh, graciously volunteer his time. So is Dr. Um, Lee um, to facilitate um, today's session. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, Dr. Lee, okay, yes. Thank you, Professor Lee. So um, thank you. Um, Usually before I start a lecture, I will invite one sound of the singing bowl to invite all of us back to the present moment. To start with, I want to say thank you. Not just thank you for coming to attend this presentation, but I see so many familiar faces, so much gratitude in my heart. Jane, President Todd, Dr. Victor Gabriel, Venerable D, and former students, Professor Len uh, Lancaster, Vanessa, without any one of you, I wouldn't be here, wouldn't be able to develop so-called Buddhist counseling, publish a book, and to be who I am. And I think this mindful path to well-being, one very important message that I want to bring out is gratitude, kindness, and gratitude. I think when we are able to appreciate all things that happen to us and see the beauty of that, it is a very good, very important training of our mind to be sensitive to happiness in the world. And that sensitivity of happiness can be a strong foundation to support our cultivation and to help us to protect us against all the suffering that we have to face. So I'm George and humbly, I am very happy to be able to share with all of you in the last few years, what I see, what I think based on my limited wisdom of what is Buddhist counseling. And hopefully this is not a uh, so-called just a presentation but a dialogue, a collaboration, um, an effort that we can all do together in order to make Buddhism more accessible to different corners in the world, in different communities. To do that, um, I have uh, four goals for today. So first one is hopefully I can share 
a little bit of my story of what is Buddhist counseling to give you some background. Secondly, uh, based on some requests, some people have heard about mindfulness and see that this is a big concept. And in Buddhism and in psychology, there are little different interpretations. And I want to share a little bit of what I see as the main differences of the mindfulness in two schools. And third, some of you coming or online are actually expecting to hear something more professional. So I will say a little bit of how do I apply that Buddhist counseling model in my professional practice. While today, I know most of our audiences may come from all range of different backgrounds. So the final part of the presentation will be basically for everyone, for any person, what can we learn about Buddhism in a way of counseling so that we can be a happier person in this difficult world? Well, it all stuck with uh, this when I was in the United States. So, okay, just to make sure you understand the person, the gentleman sitting standing there is me, okay? 2009 in Los Angeles, it is me. When I showed the picture to my wife, she didn't recognize me. And again, this talk is not about weight loss. It's not a weight loss talk, okay? This is a mindfulness Buddhist counseling talk, okay? So I was a student in the United States. Uh, when I was 18, uh, I finished high school in Hong Kong. I came to the States to study my uh, first bachelor's uh, in psychology. And then later I get my master in marriage and family therapy and later do my doctorate in uh, clinical psychology, first doctorate. This is uh, when I was a doctoral student, which looked like an old professor. So. At that time, like as a student being born and raised in Hong Kong, coming from Eastern Asian culture, of course, I was very excited to learn all about psychology, psychological understanding of human mind, behaviors, cognitive psychology, human motivations, all those kind of big concepts. And I always have one question in mind that I don't quite get it answered, which is, Yes, psychology is good. We learn a lot in school, and I know many of you have learned about psychology, but how come out of all the theorists, out of all the philosophers, we don't use any Eastern philosophy in psychology? When I was a student, I was very, uh, uh, how should I say, very motivated to find out, well, you know, Eastern wisdom, Taoism, Confucianism, Buddhism, there are so many great profound wisdom about human life, about, about, about human suffering. But somehow it was not integrated to Western psychology. And when I read the textbook, I keep thinking and wishing that the next page, there would be an Asian guy talking about like how to liberate from suffering. But sadly, no, it didn't happen. So the story goes as uh, finishing bachelor's, finishing master's, finishing doctorate, and then I become a assistant professor of this university. This is the first place that I actually get to know Buddhism. At that time, this university, it was the greatest three years of my academic life, um, being able to be surrounded by lovely, compassionate colleague, being able to uh, teach like very great students, like some of you guys, Ooh, right? Ah, yes, I was talking about her, yes. <laughs> and, and things are great, but something happened. I had to go through a very difficult time in my life. And then at that time, I tried to turn to psychology. I talked to people. Yes, Peter, go, okay. And it didn't help. What I learned, what I know about psychology no longer helped. And in that very difficult, very chaotic time, the only thing that can bring me some inner peace was when I go to Buddhist, uh, I mean, Silai Temple to listen to Venerable Wei Dong teaching meditation, was when I sat in Dr. William Chu, Professor William Chu's class, learning about old early Buddhism and talking to colleagues like Dr. Victor Gabriel. Those are the time that I found that wow, Buddhism is really something. At that time, I was still pretty considered. I was coming from a psychology perspective, thinking that maybe I can go into the world of Buddhism and cherry pick some of the good things and make a psychological model. Very considered, and many people in our field still do it nowadays. Very quickly, um, I went back to Hong Kong, and then I met another mentor, Venerable Hin Hong, he was actually the first one that challenged that really big arrogance of me. The first meeting that we had, 
uh, I didn't know what to expect. It was in University of Hong Kong. If you know, it's a pretty prestigious university, at least from the outside. Um, so he asked me two questions when I saw him. The first one is, so what do you want to do? And what can you do? I was like, wow, I thought we were just chatting. And then I said, I said, okay, as a psychologist, I learned to do uh, teaching, research, psychological testing. I published this paper, uh, being a program assistant chair, like all those kind of great things, thought that it would impress him. And he said, well, you said you are a psychologist, right? Then you tell me, tell me one psychologist that is better than the Buddha. The Buddha is the best psychologist. I ponder for a second and think, wow, that was right. Out of my understanding of all the great psychologists in the realm of uh, psychology, clinical psychology, I've never heard any psychologist that can actually claim to liberate from suffering and have developed a way to liberate other people from suffering. So because of that, I really buy into Buddhism and switch club. And very quickly, after a few years of hard work, and a lot of clicking. So somehow Buddhist counseling happened. Again, this is not about weight loss, but I do have to say there is research evidence on mindfulness-based eating. Uh, Jean Cristilla developed that program for eating disorder. It has been very helpful. It doesn't need any medication. They just need to be a lot more mindful and aware of their way of eating. We will talk about that. And if you want to look good, if you want to look skinny, study Buddhism, learn Buddhism, practice Buddhism, then you can make that switch like that. So in University of Hong Kong, we developed a few important programs. Uh, before I came, they have a master in Buddhist studies, but it was a very theoretical program to introduce students to the basic essential theories in Buddhism. After I came in, we developed a master in Buddhist counseling, maybe the first official master program in counseling, at least in Asia. And then we also developed a postgraduate diploma, which actually allows students who finish the master's program to receive professional training to become recognized professional counselor. We were also able to develop a licensing, like not officially state or like government recognized, but like locally professional recognized licensing board from the Hong Kong Buddhist Association, which is a hundred years old, the oldest Hong Kong Buddhist Association to develop a committee to register or license the Buddhist counselor. So after this couple of years, finally, we can proudly say that we have registered um, or like in this language here, licensed um, Buddhist counselor in Hong Kong now. So with all that knowledge, training, developing model and teaching Buddhist counselors that I want to share a little bit with you, starting from the insight to mindfulness. So how many of you have heard about mindfulness? Do you mind to you raise your hand? Oh, everyone, everyone. Very good, very good, very good. So can anyone tell me why does mindfulness work in psychology? Suddenly, I don't know. It just works. The research that it works, no one knows, right? So mindfulness in psychology, from my understanding of the history, was about 30, 40 years ago, John Kabat-Zinn, uh, the father of my Western mindfulness. He was a Zen practitioner, and he see the power of mindfulness. In order to spread out to more people, he secularized it, make it non-faith based so that more people can benefit from that. And this is how he and later colleagues define mindfulness. They defined mindfulness as paying attention in a particular way, on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. This is a big word, not judging. And there's a research about other way of defining mindfulness, which this one is actually mostly accepted by the scholars. Pretty similar. Mindfulness is generally defined to include focusing one's attention in a non-judgmental or accepting way on the experience occurring in the present moment. And they talk about what is not mindfulness. Okay, so we have many Buddhists here. How many of you feel that, yeah, this is a good answer. Right mindfulness is something like that. I'm satisfied. Of course, no, right? Or else why will you be here? You will be in other psychological conferences. You will be in the ABA. So let's look at 
what was taught by the Buddha in the Satipatthana Sutta. In Western mindfulness, they were not clear about what we are attending to and what is the purpose. But in Buddhism, it's very clear that samasati, right mindfulness, there is a direction. What, uh, what is the opposite of right? Left or wrong, right? So there's certain kind of direction that when you practice it, it's not a kind of like, oh, just be at the present moment, nothing to care about. It might be part of that, but this is all a component on a much more profound process. So the Satipatthana said, Satipatthana Sutta said, and what is right mindfulness? There is the case where a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed, and distress with reference to the world. And the sutta talk about body, feelings, mind, and dharma, or sometimes translated as mental qualities one by one. You can see that first body in and of itself is like seeing reality at it is. You try to see your feeling, your body in a non-I, non-self way to see it at least. And besides that, there is a very important goal that when you do that, you need to put aside all the greed, all the unwholesome mental factors and help you concentrate. And this is a direct path to a purification of mind. So in that, you can see it's very different. First of all, in the Western psychology, accepting non-judgmental, it cannot really capture the essence. In Buddhist mindfulness, we have a very important criteria to discern. We need to discern what is going on to understand, not, not exactly to judge, but you need to analyze, evaluate, to understand what is going on, to see and, and contemplate in a way. Also, in the Satipatthana Sutta, if you read it, it talks about something that was not really mentioned in psychology. Five hindrances, ill wills, love, torpor, those kind of things, right? Restlessness, worries, like in Western mindfulness, they cut it all out. But in Buddhism, it's very important when we are able to come back to our body. To contemplate on body, we need to also see feeling. What feeling do I have? Those are the sensations. What is pleasant, neutral, unpleasant, and with the sensation, how our mind reacts to the sensations. When there is a sensation, it doesn't mean that our body automatically feel a pleasant feeling. Maybe there's a bodily feeling. Our mind said this is a pleasant feeling. When our mind said there's a pleasant feeling, we like it. We grab it. It becomes something new and continue in a process like that. The 12 links that depend on origination, right? But most of the time, we just think that it's automatic. It's habitual. If you are able to practice mindfulness to slow down bit by bit, you can see they are actually gap in between each place. Just like how many of you like Cheesecake Factory? Coming back to the United States, Cheesecake Factory is something that I always remember. No, no one like cheesecake? Oh, that's why all of you look so healthy. Very good. Very good, very good. Liking cheesecake, I mean like cheesecake by itself is empty. It has an empty nature. It's just like putting some kind of a butter, sugar, some sweetened together, right? But when our body, our mind get in touch with that, magic happens. Pleasant feeling. I crave for it. I like it. I want it. It becomes something. I have to have it again and again and again, even though you know the consequences. It ain't too much. It may bring you suffering. It may you gain weight and go back to the George in 2009, but you don't care. You immerse too much in that sukkha, in that happiness temporary, and ignore all the consequences. That is the opposite of mindfulness. So. With that said, Bhikkhu Bodhi also try to use a simpler way to define Buddhist mindfulness. Sati provides a connection between two primary canonical meanings as memory and lucid awareness of the present happenings. I want to point to memory, Satipatthana, memory, recollection, remember what is the problem, remember what things work. Okay, how many of you actually practice Meditation or mindfulness, of course, like venerables, I know, right? Do you actually, like some of, sometimes when I teach students or when I teach clients meditation, in a moment, they are, ah, so pleasant, it's okay. When they come back, they forgot about everything. And many times they will say, 
oh, you know, just now when I was meditating, I gained some insight to certain things, but when I opened my mind, I forgot everything, something like that. So we need to develop that recollection to understand and remember, to know and see what are the conditions that can contribute to a pleasant state and unpleasant state so that the next time we can be more mindful and next time being more mindful and then our practice can progress. But all that I was talking about was not in the Western mindfulness. So from what I see in summary is in Buddhism, we have the noble evil path with right view, samadhi T to be the central or the forerunner that all the practices you have actually should lead to that. While Western mindfulness, I think they did not take the right mindfulness. They just take the mindfulness without right or wrong into something also very helpful. I'm not saying it's not helpful. It's very helpful, but it's not enough. It may not be transformative. And I do believe if people learn more about Buddhist teachings, when they put it back to the context, it can even benefit more people or benefit each people in a much deeper transformative way. But of course, like all the things I said, I know it's being recorded. A lot of psychology experts were tagged, but I mean, I mean, like, yeah, if you don't be bold and talk about what you think, then I mean, like, well, what is, what is the meaning of uh, uh, being Buddhist and spreading our Dharma, right? It's okay. So just to pinpoint some of the differences on mindfulness. First of all, Buddhist mindfulness, it cannot be separated from Buddhist teaching. When you have mindfulness, it is a tool. This is a tool, just like when you practice single pointedness to reach jhana. Just jhana is not enough for liberation. You are actually training up your mind to be able to realize the law of reality. Dependent core arising, paticca, samupada, those are all with mindfulness to supplement you, at least from an early Buddhist teaching perspective, okay? To support you to be able to do that so that when you realize those kind of laws, you have a steady mind and realize that so you can liberate from suffering. It's the same rationale as going to gym. How many people work out? Well, you got all look so well. Wow, that's why, huh? Okay. Work out, working out our muscles, right? If you work out and do sports, when you work out, you are usually enhancing your capacity to do certain kind of sports, right? You do golf, tennis, basketball, soccer. If you work out certain places of your body, then you usually do better actions, more better movement. Same thing as mindfulness. Mindfulness is working out our mind. When your mind becomes stronger, you have a stronger, more clear, more stable ability to observe, to know, to think to sustain attention so that you can get more insights into things so that you can see out of our stream of consciousness or the train of thought, they are actually gap and you can make little decision to not think or think about something else or, or deliberatively think about the same thing. This is all about stopping. And in mindfulness practice, in at least my understanding of mindfulness practice in Buddhism, there are many layers. There are many different things. Like I said, the five hindrances, you can contemplate on the mental factors, or even when you like something. Every day, we do something that we like or we don't like. We eat something that we like or don't like. We see people we like and we don't like. Most of the time, we just assume when that happened, I don't like it. Oh, I wait too long in Starbucks. I hate it. Or, oh, I tried a chocolate cheesecake. I love it. All those kind of actions is actually embedded with a lot of voices from our mind, a lot of reactions from our mind, but we don't know. We just take it for granted. We didn't have the differentiation. So one of the practices is actually listen deeply to your mind and hear what it says and understand Wow, do I have to believe in everything my mind said? And no, but what my mind said, what may be my attachment? What may be the clinging? And not to go for it. And finally, mm -hmm. mental reminder. This is an important thing. Usually when I teach clients meditation, one question that I will ask them is right, like right before the end, I may guide. So just now in the meditation, try to remember which moments you more you were able to calm down and focus and soothe your mind. 
and try to remember how do you position yourself? How do you notice your breath? How do you actually come to that moment and try to bring it back to the present? Something like that, so that they would uh, continue to practice next time. And also another thing as a teacher, I will give client or ask client to write down certain kind of insights so that they remember. Okay, so the next topic also about mindfulness, but also about Buddhist counseling is why does mindfulness work? In psychology, we have been using mindfulness for like more than 20 years. But when you ask a regular clinician about why it works, they may not give a very profound answer. So I would like to give you a, my understanding, one of the Buddhist answer. Okay, first of all, the two arrow sutta. Of, I think many of you may have heard about the two arrow sutta. Now, you guys are all, we are all human beings. We were born, we come to life. I'm sorry, there's some suffering that it has come with your birth to be a human being. There's some suffering that is just unavoidable. The Buddha called that a uh, first arrow. You are just being there and you're born with a certain kind of arrow stab in you. So can you tell me what are some of the unavoidable suffering in the world, in our life? Uh, hot weather, uh, politics, aging, sickness, dying, uh, toxic boss, or no, uh, critical mother, or some other things, right? Of course, if you look at Buddha Sutta, there may be different interpretation of what may be the first arrow. But in Buddhist counseling, we try to put it in a way that that are at least in the present conditions, the foreseeable present conditions, what are the things that you actually cannot have any control over? So those are suffering. The thing is, if we see the suffering as it is, it's actually bearable. But most of the time, we don't like that suffering. We try so hard to control things that we cannot control. We try so hard to change things that we cannot change. And the results becomes second arrows, a lot of second arrows. Like how we resist, deny this tall reality or fabricate it so that we try to not take the first arrow. But basically, it doesn't work. There are so many things that we cannot change in the world. We can keep on whining, having resentment. It will just aggregate our own suffering. This sounds a little too uh, uh, um, philosophical. Let me give you an example. Okay. So uh, let me ask you a question. What was that? Can you describe what was that? Clap. Hands clapping, right? Okay. Hand clapping is hand clapping. Imagine if you go to Target or Walmart next door, a kid is crying. What is that? A kid is crying, right? Go to Walmart, a kid is crying. The kid is crying. But if you go to Walmart with your kids and your kids are crying, then what was that? My crying children. It's so embarrassing. You know, like oh, so many people watching my talk. Stop, stop. You better stop. You know how many toys I bought you? Stop. Like I cannot let people see. I'm going to a talk later. They want to learn Buddhist counseling. If I cannot control my kids, what will I look like? No. You, you do little young ungrateful kids. Do you know how much I've sacrificed for you? You better stop. One week, no ice cream. No two weeks, no video games, nothing. We go back to Hong Kong now. So clapping. A kid crying, but a uh, my kid crying would trigger a lot of distortion, fabrications, a lot of attachment come up and fabricate a reality, because I don't accept it. Because there's a I, the ego consciousness get awakened and have I relation to everything, and in a process we call papancha sanasanka conceptual proliferations. When the papancha sanasanka conceptual proliferations be sad, control the mind. We are no longer pleasant. We are no longer present. We are no longer calm and compassionate. We become angry, we become agitated. So one thing about Buddha's teaching is we need to come back to the present moment. 
mindfulness help us to come back to the present moment when we are able to come back our present sensations to focus on one point all those kind of conceptual proliferations because we are not feeding them we're not feeling them they tend to subside they will quiet down they will sink and precipitate but that all requires training because those kind of thoughts are very alluring i'm angry I come up, I get offended. I want to teach my kids a lesson, but it's not helpful. Our strongest, our best mental state is always the state that we are calmly grounded in the present moment. We need to believe in that. We need to have confidence and faith in that so that we can train our mind to come back. When we come back, we need to think about a few things. To train the mind, we need to accept things that we cannot be changed with compassion. We can change what can be changed with faith or confidence or courage. And the most difficult thing is the third, train our mind to know the difference between the two with wisdom. Wisdom, part of that is we need to know, we need to understand, we need to accept what are the things that we cannot change so that we can accept better and we don't waste energy and we don't fabricate reality to just see them as they are. And to know what are the things that out of all the conditions I can still control. Like life is actually precious. Life is short. I cannot control when I die, but I can control what do I do starting from now every moment until I die. So that when I die, I can be more satisfied. I have no regrets. I have lived a meaningful life. I have devoted myself to cultivate my mind so that at the end, I can be more peaceful, more pleasant. So finally, what is Buddhist counseling, right? Listening to listening to George for half an hour, you still don't talk about Buddhist counseling. I'm sorry, okay? Now we will start. What is Buddhist counseling? Okay, so Buddhist counseling, uh, in the last few years, I tried to give different definition. The first one I gave a few years back was Buddhist counseling is a process of reducing suffering individuals using wisdom and interventions from Buddhism. It basically means uh, nothing special. It's a counseling model that the model itself, the content of that is based on Buddhism. What does it mean? In our Western psychology, our theoretical orientations, which means different schools of thought, our understanding of human nature, where we view why people suffer, why they can stop the suffering, all based on certain kind of Western philosophy. Humanistic, existential psychology, cognitive psychology, behaviorism, or you name it. But we can actually try to substitute that framework. We keep the framework of counseling, the way of communication, the professional ethics, or the therapeutic relationship. We can keep that. Those are fine. Those are good. But the content, the way that we lead our client can be based on Buddhist teaching. This definition I feel years, years earlier was supposed to be vague so that I want to keep it open for anyone who are interested in Buddhism, who have knowledge and expertise and practice in different lineage of Buddhism can actually use that framework of counseling and use a specific, uh, develop a specific kind of Buddhist counseling. Vajrayana Buddhist counseling, Mahayana Buddhist counseling, those are all fine. And more recently, two years ago, I use a longer explanation, mainly because, you know, like we scholar, one of the way that we make a living is that we make very simple things more complicated to look very intelligent. Okay, you see that? Look, okay, just me. Okay, not, not, not uh, uh, Jane or Victor. Like people like me, that doesn't really have that, that, that knowledge. So I do make things a little bit more complicated. So the complicated answer is, Buddhist counseling is a holistic counseling approach that helps clients to use each therapeutic encounter to open a gateway to the cultivation of mind for the purpose of gaining understanding of human nature in accord with the Buddhist view of reality. That most people, you understand each word, but putting together, it doesn't make sense. So forget all that. Forget all that. What I mean is cultivation of mind. A good counselor, a good psychologist, from my perspective, should have a strong theoretical foundation in at least one school in psychology. Not exactly Western psychology, but any kind of psychology should have a good foundation. And that foundation, we call the theoretical orientation, it should drive 
all your interaction with your client, meaning that the way that you talk, the way you listen, the way you reflect, the way that you direct clients' attention to body sensations, to feelings, to mind, to different things, it all should be congruent with Buddhist teachings. Of course, there's an ideal, but that's a direction. So my learning is mainly on early Buddhist teachings, like really influenced by early Buddhist teachings. So I place emphasis on cultivation of mind. That means that when I see a client, I always try to think what may be that person's deeper clinging attachment. And how can this dialogue, how can an intervention to help the person being more aware of their attachment and to ease a little bit on the attachment. So that's back in my mind, the goal when I do counseling. So to summarize, easiest way from my understanding to apply the Buddhist counseling, human suffering, our main course is clinging to the notion of self, not clinging to the self, okay, to the notion of self. We are not debating whether there's a self or not a self. That would not be the best way to talk about Buddhist teaching because the Buddha said, don't go to either extremes. It's about how we rigidly define who we are and have the world to go along with who we want to be. That brings us a lot of suffering. We don't have much flexibility in our mind to see the self as something, as a phenomenon of dependent co-arising. So the goal is to help clients ease the clinging to the notion of self. Many people ask like, oh, can Buddhist counseling uh, be a ultimately uh, a super mundane way of helping people? I think the answer is no. If there's any kind of counseling that get offered and after I finish, I can become an arahan, I will be the first one to sign up, right? No, too bad. But I think Buddhist counseling, at least from my perspective, will be a very good starting point to use the Buddha's direction to start the path of cultivation. And when people start on a path of cultivation, of course, I mean a gradual path, not certain enlightenment on this gradual path. Every time, every session, every time they gain some insight, it's a building block for them to have a higher cultivation. And I think as counselor or psychologist, we don't determine where clients go, when do they stop? We work with their readiness. And some clients, they actually get interested in Buddhism. So after the sessions, they still continue their practice and learning. Some clients in the Buddhist counseling, they actually get liberated from their specific felt suffering. That's okay. They alleviated their own dukkha at the time and they're good to go home and carry on with their life. An objective of mind cultivation and the intervention I use is called no, no choose. I will tell you a little bit more about that. Okay. So Buddhist counseling, another thing I want to talk to you about is conceptualization. Formulation. How do we understand people's suffering? In psychology, long time ago, we have different ways to conceptualize and formulate different models to understand why people suffer. I mean, like in class, we also talk about that long time ago, right? And even in your work, you still do that. In Buddhism, I try to make it in a simplified, hopefully like a little bit oversimplified model to explain why people suffer so that we can get some insight on how can we cease the suffering. First of all, assuming that we all come into this life with tanha, with a very strong craving. The easiest to understand is that we all, cling on to hold on to certain kind of existence of a self. But when we come in this life, it's basically, you can imagine it's kind of like certain kind of energy, certain kind of inclination that we need to glue and stick on a certain things to make this concept of self. So what do we glue on? What do we hold on to? Our values, our body, our relationships, something that when we hold on to that again and again, our mind, our self get crystallized and then believe this is I, this is I am, this is George. Um, well, this process is, I mean, like you guys look a little confused. Um, let me give you an example. So, uh, so if you are on the street and you see a very attractive person, a man or a woman, and how do you make that person become your husband or your wife or significant other. 
various philosophical question, right? How do I do that? Of course, in mundane truth, you pursue that person, you talk to the person, that person like you, you get married, sign a paper and all that. But in your mind, you actually made a decision yourself. It's not about what you what paper you signed. It's not about what you promised people. But in your mind, you have put a label. That person is mine, right? What is the difference between that? Like I'm a guy, I like girls. So what is the difference between that girl on the street and my wife? They can be the same person. But in my mind, I have a different label. And again and again, I fabricate that label to make it strong and crystallize and become that is my wife. That is the love of my life. And this is the reason for my existence so that I feel important. I feel that I exist. I feel loved and secure. So it sounds fine, right? No, usually the reality will not disappoint you by always disappointing you. Reality will never disappoint you by disappointing you. When you have that set of self-crystallized, you will have expectations to the reality. Oh, uh, the one I love should not leave. The one I love should not die, should not betray me. I should not lose a lover. Uh, when I buy a diamond, diamond symbolize love forever. So the love should not be broken, right? Something like that. Do you guys do something like that? No? No? Huh? No? Really? Oh, you guys all know love is impermanent, right? It's dependent on arising, right? Uh, and Nietzsche, uh, Paticha Samupada, you all apply to human life, right? Okay. Then it's just me, okay? I'm the only one to suffer from love, okay? Yeah, you guys are okay? Yeah, this is the line that differentiate arahanship here, mundane people here, okay? So, dukkha. One way to explain is the dissatisfaction or the discrepancy between reality and expectation. That's not the worst case. The worst case is that we have very unskillful ways to perpetrate again and again the things that we do and perpetrate the dukkha. Uh, real example, I've seen many clients, many students that they are very competent. They are actually very good, great individuals in a society, but they never think good of themselves. One reason is because they never get one of the parents or both parents' approval. And no matter how much achievement they have, how much success they have, deep inside, they still feel that I'm not good enough. And the way to cope with that dukkha is they try harder to please the parents, to convince the parents that they are worthy, they are good. And the end result is, they cannot accept the reality that sometimes our parents are just incapable to recognize or approve who we are. And then the clients, the citizen continue to suffer. That is so-called unskillful means or habit to try to make us happy. But sometimes we just need to accept reality. Coming back to the last concept, accept reality as it is. And a lot of that comes from subtly Deep inside our mind, we need to make a conscious decision to really let go of certain kind of needs and desire. Once you're able to do that, it will be freedom, liberating. But it's very hard to make that decision. You need to sometimes go through a lot of suffering, a lot of trying. First noble truth. What is the first noble truth? Suffering, dukkha, right? Sometimes if you have enough dukkha, then they come, become actually a very important, nutritious motivation for you to change and learn to let go. And then your life can be very different. Okay, so intervention. So you guys all know that, I'm going to cover that. Four Noble Truth, uh, uh, Sila, Samadhi, Panna. So in order to make it simple, I put it into a no no choose model. No no choose. Note. No choose or action words. So let me do a demonstration. Um, how uh, how do your shoulders feel like now? How do your shoulders feel like after listening for half an hour? Feel good, feel bad, no? Tense, yeah, a little bit. Okay, because the talk is too jiffinating, you feel tense and excited. Yeah, I can imagine, yeah. Okay, how does your shoulders feel like? 
how, how does it feel like? Oh, um, better? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So when I ask that question, Satipadana Sutta, start with guiding your mind back to the body. When I ask that question, I tried to guide your attention back to your body to capture a particular part of sensations. Many of you moved a little bit, right? I guess you were noting or noticing there were some unpleasant feelings in the shoulders. So you know insight wisdom. You know that, ah, that may be the way that I'm sitting or the way that I position my shoulders or the way that I tighten a little bit. I know because my position myself this way, it hurt a little bit. So I choose to move a little bit to let go and let down. So this is no, no choose. You become aware of certain things. You know why it happened and then you choose to do something different. So this is a simple model. Basically in one second, you can actually go through that whole process. And in counseling, there are many different applications. You can expand it to something very large. For example, some clients have relational issues. Usually they keep being attracted by people who are not nice to them or even being engaged in abusive relationship again and again. First, they can learn how to notice what I might be attracted to. What are the things that I get triggered into so that I actually chose to engage in that relationship to see the pattern. And then when they get awareness, they start to examine and contemplate what are the deeper attachment, what things I'm holding on to, or what past relationship I'm trying to manipulate or repeating. After they know, gain the knowledge, they come back to life. I can choose the same thing with more consciousness, or I try to choose differently. And every time, this is a cycle going round and round. Every time when I come back to choose again, I note whether that's actually making my life better, whether that's a more skillful pattern. I will keep reviewing again and again until the wheel go to a better direction. So this is the no, no choose model. Well, of course, it was a little bit too professional and theoretical, and I think uh, we can come back to a more general, public-friendly way of talking. So does anyone here want to be a happier person? Does anyone here want to be a happier person? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're like, oh, I'm so, I'm just like, oh, like in Chinese, 和此之性, I'm just happy and content by myself. And okay. Okay, you guys want to be happier, right? Yes. Okay, good. Let's talk about, let's think about how can we be happier. Okay, rule number one. Out of all the clients and students I taught, regular meditation practice can make a person happier. Sorry, no bargain. This is a final sale, okay? Yes, I know you are busy, you have this and that, you want this and that, but I know if you, if you don't want to be happy, it's okay, it's not my business. But if you want to be happy, Yes, you need to have some regular meditation practice. Well, when I teach meditation, usually I talk about the three Bs to uh, clients or students. It's easy to understand. So I need to tell you very clearly and carefully. I'm not a very smart person. I can only remember things or talk about things that is very simple to all people that can understand. So three Bs, don't know, choose those simple ways. Especially, imagine if you are doing counseling in a very intensive moment, people are traumatizing, crying, or fighting with their spouse, and the whole world is collapsing like this. I don't remember all the big concepts, but like three, we can all remember three things usually. Like, no, no choose, uh, samadhi, panasila, or like, uh, like three things is a good number. Especially three things with same letter. Body, breath, and brain. Usually explain to client how these three things, well, we're trying to find a balance of them so that they can find it in peace. For example, starting from body, this is a very important concept. When I see clients, especially clients who are anxious, usually they are dwelling most of the time in their mind, in their concepts, in their views, in their worries about the future. When I ask them, how do you feel in your body? Some of them actually have not felt their body for a long time. While some of them, when they are able to come back to the bodily 
um, bodily sensations that correlate with the feeling of anxiety, they actually instantly feel a little better just by getting in touch and feeling their body. Because phenomenon, anxiety is a phenomenon. When you break it down into different components, one of them is actually the body. You are in the present moment. If you keep on breathing, observing your body, most of the situations, most of the students and clients I've seen, anxiety can decrease by 10 to 20% just by one moment coming back to the body. Breath, teaching breath is difficult. Most of the time when you teach people mindful breathing, especially for anxious people, they'll be like, <sighs> very relaxing, <laughs> like that, right? Control, we want to control over things. We are too forceful in doing things. One of the things I try to teach people is to relax your control. Imagine yourself like a lazy boss watching people working or like sitting next to the sea, seeing a wave coming up and down like your breath. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to change anything. They're okay by yourself. This should be the way that we observe our breath and bring our mind also another very difficult thing. It goes from to the past to the future, ruminating over different things or conceptually proliferating different things. One thing I ask clients to do is always to think about meditation is the time that you are devoting to yourself to care for yourself. And I really like K. Tina Han's words about there's nowhere to go, nothing to do, we have arrived. And really use that mind to cultivate yourself. And every time when you find yourself being distracted, it's okay. Remember, our hearts, our mind, still continue to be relaxed. Just gently come back. Ajahn Brahm one time said a very important thing about meditation. He said, never underestimate the power of kindness in our practice. The power of kindness. If we can be more kind to ourselves in our mindfulness practice and share the kindness with our clients, with people around us. It can actually go a long way. So many times we cannot practice well is maybe because we're too critical of ourselves. When we do that, we cannot control. We become critical of other people. Okay, so um, we have been sitting for a long time, which is a few slides. So I just want to ask, like, do you guys want to move a little bit? You guys want to learn a different way of mindfulness? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I will talk about something non-Buddhist. In Hong Kong, when we do Buddhist counseling, we have found that many people, they cannot just sit down and relax and concentrate their mind, right? It's a common experience for you. When you teach people mindfulness, they're agitated, they are worrying, they're angry, they're ill will, they're all those kind of things. So what we develop is for some people, we need to use some movement to slowly transition back to some mindful breathing. So, how many people have tried that before? Oh, thank you. Okay, is a very traditional Chinese way of doing Tai Chi, Qi Gong, and is a somewhat simplified way. And you may think that, oh, only old people in the park or in the hospital do that. Like, why do I like such fashionable people do that, right? Well, actually, in the University of Hong Kong, we have a study showing that only for 12 weeks of balancing of 30 and 90 minutes, and you can reduce your blood pressure, you can reduce your waistline, and you can improve sleep quality and improve symptoms of anxiety and depression as totally free of charge. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Do you want to try? Yes. Are you sure? It's not easy. Are you willing to try? Okay, good. So we'll just do one move this time, okay? We'll just do one move. Okay, if you don't mind, you can all stand up together, okay? Okay, you can hear me okay, right? Okay, so for those of you who are experts in Kung Fu or Tai Chi, I'm sorry, I'm just a psychologist, okay? <laughs> okay, but I kind of know the basics. So first of all, try to Relax your body a little bit and feel that you are standing in a way that is expansive and, and your feet to open a side to be parallel to your shoulder. Very good. And then the move goes from to do your hands like this 
and the grid E go up and press to the top because my toes are gonna do all the weight and bring it out. So we will do three consecutive moves together and we can try to do the next case, okay? I don't mind for my breath. I mean like we are good at driving here, but we're not good. Okay. Okay, we'll do it together. Pretty We do a few steps, but today we don't have a lot of time. So you can watch online to see like more professional demonstration. So the trick is many times when clients are very dull, ruminating on the toes, when you help them come back to the body and relax a little bit, it feels really different. Do you feel a little different in your body now? Maybe a little bit more relaxed, perhaps a little bit earlier. Yeah, and calm down. Take a little bit. Okay, very good, have a seat, thank you. So after that, I would just uh, put back my clothes to, to become back that uh, well-dressed psychologist. Okay, give me one second. So um, in Buddhism, we say that we need to practice our mind in a way that it doesn't change with the environment, right? Xin bu sui jing zuan. But in fact, for mundane people, people who are suffering, most of the time we actually change with the environment. So one trick is that we just flourish a better environment, more peaceful environment. Hopefully they can internalize the energy and feel some presence or calmness of mind. So another thing is about mindful listening. Mindfulness is about concentrating on one sense and try to use that sense to guide your mind to be more peaceful, right? So what I would like you to do is try to listen to the singing bowl as closely, as attentively and mindfully as you can, following it from the beginning to the end. Can you do that? Yeah? So we will do it one time. Very good. In that about 30, 40 seconds, does anyone think about anything in your life that has been disturbing you, haunting you, or worrying you? No, right? When you are focusing in something pleasant, something relatively stronger, it recollect your mind, recenter your mind, ground your mind to a present moment. And that's how sometimes in Buddhist counseling, especially in an earlier process, we help them to consolidate the mind so that they can reflect, they can talk and think about things in a more detached way. Not so much dwelling into the proliferations, but more in the present moment that is more helpful, more skillful and more objective. Well, we will do a mindful briefing together. So what I would like to do is in the in-breath and out-breath, fully attend to it from the beginning to the end, okay? Are you ready? So let's do it. Breathing in, breathing out. Okay, done. You are like, what? It was a very short meditation session. Why? Because I want you to remember 
one, oneness. Many of you are actually meditators for a long time, focusing on one in and out breath, breathing in, know that you're breathing in, knowing the turn, breathing out, knowing that you're breathing out. It's very easy for you. For many people, especially people who are emotionally disturbed, they may not have that peacefulness, that inner wisdom in mind to be able to have the capacity to focus on a breath. For them, having one moment, one breath of fully attending to the in-breath and out-breath is actually very precious. It gives them hope, gives them motivation that if I can have one moment of tranquility, of equanimity, it can be two, can be five, can be ten. And for us meditators, sometimes we cannot focus fully. We can be distracted. But know that it's our mind that trains everything together. Everything can be separated with gaps, right? Every time, just focus on being fully mindful of one breath in and one breath out. That's good enough. So I do want you to remember, mindful breathing, it doesn't actually mean the longer the better just one breath fully mindful it can go a long way okay rule number two learn and practice unconditional happiness wow nowadays people are so difficult to be happy right what make you guys happy uh oh thank you Oh, any other things that makes you happy? Any guilty pleasure? Anything? Uh, uh, Netflix marathon, spicy hot pot, uh, watching some really good like Avengers movie, or like uh, going on a date with someone you really like, or like, huh? Uh, anything like? Okay. What I want to say is that we have a lot of reasons to be happy or we create a lot of reasons to allow ourselves to be happy. We always believe that happiness is not here and now. We believe that when I get that position, when I become that person, when I be with that person, when I buy a few more apartments, renting some hours, when I buy that nice watch, nice car, I will be happy. Or in the past, I was happy. I want to go back. We just rely too much on reasons to be happy. That is not healthy. Happiness can be here and now. Happiness does not need any reason. Have you ever thought about now at this moment, we are alive. We take a mindful breath. We are surrounded by people who are nice and compassionate. We can allow ourselves to be happy and be fully immersed into this happiness. So let's then do another exercise, short exercise together. Well, we have all different six senses, right? I want to try and do a few senses to see whether you can be happy. First, I want you to look around this hall and see what is actually beautiful here. If you find something beautiful, I want you to look more closely. See the features, see the colors, appreciated yeah some of you are looking at me thank you <laughs> and i want you to pause a moment and listen to the sounds in this room or wherever you are the sound in your surrounding what do you hear And try to enjoy what you hear. The fan, air conditioning, it can be pretty soothing. And then I want you to take three breaths and feel the joy in the in and out breath. Observe three breaths. And finally, Think about one thing that happened today that made you happy. For me, one happy thing is I know that 
Professor Lancaster is doing well. I'm very, very happy. I'm very, very happy to see him. So also very happy to see old friends and meet new friends. And very grateful to be able to talk about Buddhism with you. I am very happy. So this technique that I create is modified from a psychological technique of grounding, which is using different senses to ground your mind to the present moment. But I think that grounding can be even changed to happiness grounding. Anytime when you take a pause to notice the surrounding, there are actually many things that can make us happy. Well, finally, number, rule number three, I don't have to be who I am and there is a choice to be me or not be me written from non-self and nata. Well, let's talk about choice for a second. Choice moment by moment. When we think about choice in a five aggregate, we think about volitional formation, mental formation, sankara. But when people translate sankara, some of them actually have a very different translation. Some people translate as configurations or fashioning, but some people translate that as a decision or a choice a mental choice of how we see the world, how we think, how we speak, because all of them generate karma and portray our world. So let me ask you a question. Eating. How many people like to eat here? Ah, thank you. Wow, we talk about eating. People are much more responsive. Very good. If you reflect on your choices, how many choices do you think you made for eating per day? Just one day, how many choices do you have made in your mind, in your decisions, in your speak about choices? How many would say uh, more than 50? More than 100? 60? More than 200? 300? Oh, how many people say less than 10? Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, wonderful. Wow. Okay. Very good. Very good. Wow. Very cultivated. Thank you. Okay. From my research with a collaborator with Jean Christilla that I told you about, experts in mindfulness eating. She was studying how to help people with this eating disorder to make different choices. The first thing she needs to study is how many choices do people make? And she said on average, not cultivated in uh, venables, okay? 400, 400 choices. Okay, think about uh, how many people eat McDonald's Oh, wow, you guys are so healthy. Eat, but not, never McDonald's. Okay, if you see, huh? Sometimes, okay, sometimes. Ah, I like the honesty. When we see McDonald's, your mind think about the food. You decide that you walk in, you see other food, you decide you want it or not. When you see the menu, you go over the menu, like 10, 20 items. Do I want it? No, do I want it? No, oh, I want this and no. When you see the food, you see the food, you decide to take it, you take it to your table. You decide which food to start eating. You decide which one to put in your mouth, how many times you chew. Every time you chew, you make a choice. When, when you also decide when do you swallow, when do you give into your urge of swallowing, which is the next food you eat. You keep on making decisions one by one by one by one, moment by moment. And then you ate up a supersized meal two times. Something like that, right? Not, not you, okay? So if we're not being mindful. So... So many times, the stream of consciousness, we are not aware of the choices that we made so that we end up doing things that we regret later. How many times, how many decisions have you made in a fight when you fight people? Uh, how many people fight here? No people fight here. Uh, sorry, Venable. Venable is like the excuse from that. How many of you ever, how many of you have ever said something or do something that you regretted later when you were angry? Yeah, see? Yeah, me too, right? It's because it's choice by choice by choice. Things get, get escalated. And there's something that, some choices that we actually made, but we are not aware of. We just take it for granted and thought that it's actually a continuum, but it's not. In Buddha's practice, when we are mindful, we don't let that kind of habit, that kind of eye get triggered and controlled over us. We're trying to find the gap. Uh, not the fashion brand, okay? The gap. In between all the choices, there are gap between the next one, between the next one. So what we do is we try to have a little detachment. We try to have a little mental distance from the I and not let that rigidly I define who I am. It's a little metaphysical. So usually when I work with clients, 
to help them make a choice to be who I am, I use an exercise called unlabeling. Like I said, in a conceptualization diagram, we have the craving, we have the tanha to be who we are. And then we find all the labels to attach on ourselves, and we define that this is me. So what I do with clients is that I have them draw a stick figure and imagine this is you. And then I ask the person to use post note to write down what are the characteristics that other people post on you and what are the characteristics that you post on yourself. After this person have all the stickers, you usually have a dialogue. How do you think about the stickers? Do you like them? Do you not like them? Will some of the stickers actually feed some of your needs to be acknowledged, be loved, to be secure? After that, I ask the client to take down the sticker, take down something that they don't like, and write some new stickers that they like to put into that. That's uh, one of the first steps to show them the self, the eye can be more flexible than they think. And after the processing, asking how they feel, then I, the last step is I ask the client to take down the sticker, respect and acknowledge each one of them, but take them down one by one by one. And finally, invite them to look at that empty stick figure and ask them, oh, how does it feel like if you are actually empty? You don't have to be bounded by any label. This is just you. You don't have to be anything. You don't have to carry any labels, any packages with you. How would it feel? And give them a minute to contemplate emptiness if I don't have to be put any labels on me. So that's one of the ways that I help clients try to feel a little bit, just a little place, a little uh, visualization of non-self. I don't have to be who I think I am. And usually they find it pretty interesting. They find some freedom in it and I can decide what I want to be if I don't have to be defined in a certain way. Well, some questions that I ask clients, sorry that like the, the PowerPoint was a little different than what I, it comes out. Like if we are able to stop and pause in a moment. One homework that I would like to give you is next time when you are actually upset, I invite you to take three breaths before you react. And when you have time, think about what if I can accept reality as it is? What if I don't have to be me at this moment? What if I can think and love myself and the other person a little more at this moment. Just let the questions drop and see what happens. And usually they can help us being less attached to who we are. Okay. Ooh. And um, in the book, it sort of talks about choices, different way of choices. Of course, the top choice is let go. Let go is not just abandoning or going away. It is to truly understand and accept reality so that we let go of our clinging, not let go of a person or event. And then we can cultivate a more pleasant and compassionate attitude to that. Finally, I want to end with, well, we talk about choices. And many times I know we cannot have a lot of choices in life, but don't forget that many choices are actually very personal inside our hearts. Just like I saw in the movie, Still Humid. You cannot choose not to sit on wheelchair, but you choose how to sit on it. I think that captured the essence of this talk. And I want to remind ourselves to be a happier person. My understanding of Buddhist counseling, regular meditation practice, no bargain. Practice more unconditional happiness to make yourself have a stronger foundation to be happy. And finally, you have a choice. You don't have to be who you are. You can be anyone. And if you are interested in this book, you can scan a QR code and it can go to the Amazon and, and, and order the book. And, uh, and, and all, you can also search the guided Buddhist counseling online and see which deal is the best. But then usually like uh, Amazon, if, uh, if you don't need to pay for shipping, is okay. Or Rolich also have a good price. Finally, I just want to thank you so much for inviting me to come back and see so many familiar faces and meet new friends. I wish all of us be well, be happy, and be free from suffering. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Minhua, uh, and thank you. Um, now we transition to the um, second stage of answer and question. And before we move on, I would also would not want to admit to acknowledge Fo Guang San Shi Lai Temple for sponsoring tonight uh, this afternoon program and also LA County Mental Health Services. And thank you. So let me just uh, briefly introduce myself. I'm Derek Shea. I, uh, I'm with LA County Department of Mental Health. I manage one of the uh, outpatient clinics uh, operated by the Department of Mental Health in LA County that specialize with the AAPI population in, uh, here in LA. So, uh, so I'm very, very grateful to have an opportunity. Uh, first of all, Dr. Ta, we, we met and then intro, uh, sort of invited me to, to join, just to join the stage and, and, uh, and to facilitate or just to have a little bit more discussion. So. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, thank, thank you, you so much for your wonderful presentation. Please have a seat. So, so my my um, my my role here today is just to just to raise a few questions, to kind of get the stage warmed up. Because my understanding is that there's going to be a Q and A portion, really for, from the audience. So, so so really, uh, so I'm just going to ask a few questions to kind of get us warmed up a little bit. Uh, uh, but again, first of all, I have to say, uh, Dr. Lee, really, really uh, appreciate your uh, efforts and, and what a wholesome effort to try to bring in Buddhist teaching and uh, wisdom into counseling and into this, this whole field of, of helping people with a lot of mental suffering. So thank you so much for your efforts. I want to also want to thank you for your willingness to support that because it means a lot uh, for people in your position to see the need or the interest in applying some Asian wisdom into counseling. I really hope that it can benefit more people who are affiliated with Buddhism or any other Asian wisdom. Thank you. Of course, no, thank you. I, I think, you know, like when I first came into to psychology and mental health, I, I also have this and came into Buddhism and I was like, wow, what it would be wonderful to have integrate these two, right? And it was maybe one day I'll be able to, to do that, but over the times, <laughs> no, not really uh, happened yet, but uh, at least for me, but I know there's been some really wonderful work, as you mentioned, even in the field of mindfulness, I think there's a lot of really exciting uh, uh, efforts, um, but I totally uh, agree with you that in some ways that is not really a full capture of so much of the Buddhist uh, teaching. Uh, so it's really uh, very, very much, uh, uh, you know, kind of welcoming such an exciting effort to, to really try to bring more of that wisdom and teaching. So, so I guess, I guess, you know, listening to you again, I, it's my first time listening to, to your talk and on this topic. And uh, there are many sort of questions at the same time. I'm just trying to learn also because there's so much to learn. And, and to be honest, my understanding of a Buddhist teaching is still very limited. So I'm, I'm still learning myself. Um, you know, one thing that, as you pointed out, for example, in the, the field of psychology and, and actually in our society these days, um, mindfulness has actually become quite popular, right? So I, when I walk into a health market like Sprouts and I see these uh, magazines that it has these delicious healthy food and also would have title to say, Oh, mindfulness practices for uh, reduced stress and for better sleep, and, and it sells in bookstores and all these shelves after shelves of books on mindfulness and, and magazines. They're very trendy in some ways. Um, and, and to what you shared a little bit earlier, and again, I'm not an expert in this, in this area, but I also know that, for example, some of the mindfulness based therapy have also become quite popular in our field of mental health. So, for example, you know, uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, you know, mindfulness-based stress reduction, as you mentioned, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, acceptance and commitment therapy. So, some of these are all sort of mindfulness-based approaches. And, and I think you explained quite well, and for the audience that may not be as familiar with that, and I, I again, my limited understanding is that it generally you know, try to encourage these approaches, try to encourage a sort of a, 
sort of a non-judgmental sort of uh, uh, you know you know stance to our inner and external experiences. You know, kind of with a lot of openness, acceptance. Uh, you know, with some sense of curiosity to sort of look at that experience or be aware of it, but yet sort of accept it, right? So in, in some sense, that in itself has been quite helpful. Um, you know, for example, because as you pointed out in the second arrow uh, situation, for a lot of people, uh, you know, it is, even if we just develop some ability to just to maybe you know, to accept a little bit more instead of sort of avoiding or running away from our upsetting and pleasant physical or emotional or, or thoughts and, and to resort to some kind of, you know, avoidance strategies or unhealthy uh, stress reduction strategies. And some people use, for example, you know, drugs and alcohol or uh, food or, uh, you know, just gambling, some other um, behavior Again, with, with just the goal, just to just at least to get out of this upsetting and miserable thoughts or emotions and physical states. So having some ability to at least to have perhaps a, a different relationship with response to maybe how we're thinking, how we're feeling and how our physiological states, just, just changing that relationship a little bit uh, is already very, very helpful, right? And to, to, to minimize the second arrow that we often so much create, uh, create more problems. When we're in a bad situation, we create more problems for ourselves. So, so I guess, I guess you know, part of that, I, I'm just curious, uh, because as, as you also pointed out, um, you know, the approach that you're describing in Buddhist counseling and, and some of the elements you touch on, uh, you know, again, some of the Buddhist practices is very profound and, and in some ways to have the wisdom and to have even some concentration uh, is, is not easy. And, and especially for a person who is not like monastics as well as serious meditators, uh, it's quite difficult to cultivate enough of that concentration or calm to, to see those insights. Uh, uh, but it, 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 I'm just curious, but in your experience, even just that momentary uh, calmness uh, and just e even at a, a, a small level is enough to uh, create uh, enough of a shift to come out of their suffering or their pain or anguish. Is that, is that the experience? I'm curious about that. So, well, this is a good question. So many times when I talk about differences between Western mindfulness and Buddhist mindfulness, uh, it, it conveys a sense that all oh, Buddhist one is better. But actually what I want to say is, I think the Western mindfulness is great. If there is not any action in Western mindfulness, I don't think we can develop so-called Buddhist counseling. It's, it's a, such a um, easy to understand, secularize, popular way for people to start understanding what may be mindfulness and get them interested in what might be Buddhist teaching. So, uh, I mean, the, the first part of my response is that I think if we are able to add some Buddhist framework, so for people who are able to, like you said, being more accepting, more open, and uh, uh, less ruminating about second arrows, then they can even go further. They have a level two to do, but the level one is actually very important. And for me, I think uh, for beginning level treatment, like when I uh, was a student, I also learned MBSL and now doing uh, Buddhist counseling. The beginning level is actually very similar. We are just training clients' mind to be able to consolidate more, to help them feel when they actually can focus on somewhere, their mind can have more peace. Than they, uh, than they can ever do when they were engaging in other more harmful, unskillful behaviors like addiction or other things. And for me, the most important turning point for many cases is when in the session, they are able to feel, ah, oh, I can have a moment of not really thinking. I can have a moment of oh, feeling peaceful. And that's a feeling that 
I have never felt or I don't remember how is it like. And to be empowered to know that just by breathing, focusing, or doing things, I can actually generate that kind of mind state. That part is usually a turning point in many sessions that uh, many clients that I encounter. It's mainly because most of us are, are kind of wired in in certain kind of pattern of pursuing, grasping things, or running away, or complaining. That we rarely have a time to really just pause and relax and be here. Like I said earlier, we never believe that happiness, calmness can be at the present moment. So once we realize is that, wow, actually the world doesn't work that way. There's any, another kind of joy, not those dramatic happiness. Another kind of peace that I don't need to keep running or going, thought that I'm getting it in somewhere in the future. It can be just here. That part, it can cultivate certain kind of motivation for them to continue their practice. But like you said, sometimes it can become very, it, it can be difficult because some people neurologically or biologically or their mind, it's just more difficult for them to focus and relax. And for me, similar to the pattern that we did, I try to use more different ways to help them consolidate their mind, such as art, drawing, uh, mindful drawing, drawing with them. Another thing that we also research on and did in Hong Kong U is actually chanting. We have many variables here. So chanting is not something novel. So chanting uh, in Hong Kong U, we actually did a research about chanting Abhidhaba, Omitofo, something that some uh, many of you have heard about. So we try to see when people who are exposed to image that actually induce a fear response. We try to measure if they keep on chanting Abhidhaba versus chanting Santa Claus, Santa Claus, Santa Claus, whether their response to the fear will be different. And we found that when people are exposed to the fearful image, both of them, their amygdala, their EEG are actually all activated. But people who chanted Abhidhamma, they actually calm down much quicker than people who chant uh, Santa Claus, Santa Claus, Santa Claus, when no one chants Santa Claus actually. But then in reality, they won't do that. But then when they were able to chant Abhidhamma, then it can help them to cope with very stressful response. So chanting is one of the ways that we use in Buddhist counseling with a lot of considerations. First, if the client is not Buddhist, then we will not impose that. We still need to work from their worldview. I saw a client, she was Catholic, and I asked her, so what kind of Bible paragraph that has to resonate with you? And we take some paragraph and do the chanting together that actually become a way for her to soothe her mind and become mindfulness practice. So secondly, even though the client's Buddhist, we actually need to understand what is their own practice? Would there be something about their own practices that can help them to consolidate their mind to the present moment so that they can develop that kind of inner peace to help them cope with all the other things that is bombarding them or haunting them? So that's a little bit of my clinical experience. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential even across different faith traditions. Uh, I think that uh, my understanding is that Catholic tradition, they also have uh, what's called the centering prayer, uh, which or it's very contemplative. Uh, uh, I think it's Father Thomas Keating who, who is advocating for that. And, and it's actually being used, my understanding is being used quite a bit in the addiction uh, work. work. Um, a lot of example uh, here in the, in the U.S. Uh, to deal with addictions, the, one of the major approach is the 12 steps tradition, right? And then they also very much uh, uh, use the center, uh, use the uh, serenity prayer, which is very similar to the concept that you were sharing. Uh, the, the, you know, God, you know, grant me the uh, uh, ability to accept the things I cannot change, uh, the, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, right? So I think most of the AA members, they usually start or end the meeting with that, with that prayer. Uh, and um, so I think there's a lot of cross uh, uh, room for a lot of really wonderful uh, uh, common grounds. Um, and, uh, and, and the whole area of spirituality and mental health, there's so much uh, important need to, to, to have that cross. 
Um, now, now uh, so, so I guess one of the things, uh, many folks here are not uh, mental health professionals, but obviously they're, they're, they're interested enough to be here, uh, besides if some of them know you and, and really wanted to hear from you, but probably because people are attracted by your title, right? Because when you talk about a mindful path, to well-being, and I think, like you said, everybody wants happiness, wants well-being, and this, this, in in our uh, in our existence, in our in our life, you know, I think unavoidably, or I, I think that's pretty much the the common pursuit for all, probably all beings. So, if you could, I know you already gone through quite a bit of different uh, aspects. Uh, so in some ways, you may have already answered this question. But if you could just briefly, again, uh, for those of us that are still sort of trying to make sure we're clear on the key uh, you know, essence of the approach that you're describing, or uh, just kind of how you see as the path to well-being uh, from the perspective of Buddhist psychology, if you could say. So I would start with something that is more generic to something more specific. Um, on my path of becoming a Buddhist counselor, psychologist, I try to learn from many different people. There was a time I was consulting my colleague who is a psychiatrist about, oh, so I'm seeing some clients who have depression. Can you tell me what maybe some new medication for a patient that actually has less side effects? And as a very senior psychologist, his response was, Hi, why do you want to take medication? It's not good for you. Let's do something else. I was like, you're a psychiatrist. What are you talking about? And he said, remember, very important things. Sleep well, eat well, get some exercises, and have some good connections in human life. Then you're fine. If all of them you did, but you still cannot do well, then yeah, then, then uh, we try some medication. And I talked to my Venerable Sifu, Venerable Hin Hong, who is the founder of the Center of Buddhist Studies, there was uh, another consultation. I asked him, hey, Sifu, uh, my uncle said he may be haunted. He may be seeing some ghost. Uh, what should he do? As a very senior monk, he said, ah, eat well, sleep well, exercise, have some good connection and sunshine, then you will be okay. I said, huh? Isn't that you're doing some rituals or some, some sutras and something like that? He said, yeah, you could. You can uh, recite Diamond Sutra or something like that. The most important thing is your own energy. If you have a good, strong foundation of your body, then it's easier to have a good foundation of your mind. And then I read some early Buddhist suttas. Uh, Mangala Sutta, maybe some venerable has heard, have heard about that one. They're pretty famous too. It talks about... It's, uh, somewhat more mundane, like do you actually have a good environment for your cultivation? You need to associate with good friends, friends of wisdom. You need to be nice to your parents. So basically, Buddhism also talk about very lively things. How can we take care of our environments and our body can set a very important foundation for us to cultivate, to live a happy life. So I'm not kidding, try your best to eat well, sleep well, exercise, get some sunshine, have some good social connections. Those are very important foundations. Well, I mean, like you go to psych, uh, psychologists or physician, they tell you to do that. How many of you here did all four of them regularly? Sleep well, sleep well. Oh, that's why you're, you're happy people. Some of them are like, oh, like easy true, but we need to believe in that, have faith and do that. And for a deeper thing, uh, because to answer that question for Buddhist psychology, I can go for like super mundane, like to be like really transcendent, talking about non-self, being arahant or more mundane truth. But I think mundane is more important at this stage as many clients, they may be seeking for some liberation from their specific suffering now. So one thing I think that is very important is, can we expect our life that can only be reasonably happy? Expect a life that has suffering. First noble truth, dukkha. So many times we suffer because we do not expect suffering in life. We do not expect things to change. We do not expect to lose important ones. We do not expect that 
I would gain like 30 pounds to be 191 pounds, right? A lot of suffering is our expectation do not meet with reality. I think if we want a life that is reasonably happy, that is much more durable and it helps us cope with disappointment much more effectively. And third thing is, how can we find out what is our deeper, more wholesome values and meanings for life? Even for cultivator, for, for, for great cultivator, we all have different sense of meanings. Maybe compassion is your meaning. Maybe kindness. Maybe family. Maybe work or something. Life is all like a show, a movie, or a game. But in order to do well in a game, you need to use the game as a platform to cultivate the mind. If you do not play the game seriously, you cannot improve. Finding out certain kind of meanings, direction, and values in life give you a strict path and you can work hard to cultivate your mind or else we're just wasting our time. So even the Buddha talk about like, we need to be skillful at something. We need to be good at something. Life is precious. Find something you're passionate about. Find something you like. Find something you find meaningful and keep on doing it. And in the process, if you're a Buddhist, learn and practice Buddhism or any kind of spirituality or religion. We just need the process as a path as a tool to help us have a chance to cultivate our mind. So those are the three things I would suggest from a more mundane level of Buddhist psychology. Thank you, Dr. Lee. You know, just as you're talking initially, uh, you know, I very much agree with you in the sense that, that exercise is, is really important. Um, I, uh, just to share a little bit, um, I, when I was in high school, I was struggling with depression. Uh, for a few years. And, and uh, of course, you know, getting psychotherapy was very helpful for me. And that's why I went to the field. Uh, uh, but over the years, there's still times, you know, struggle with feeling of anxiety and depression. So I find exercise was very helpful for me. And also, uh, uh, you know, like you said, meditation or even uh, doing some metta or loving kindness meditation was very helpful for me. Uh, even the um, uh, what I learned over the years about, you know, just simple practices like gratitude journals. You guys know about gratitude journal. So it's not a lot of positive psychology research found that if, even if you just write three to five things that you're grateful for, uh, uh, it could be small things. Like, like you mentioned, Thich Nhat Hanh talk about the non toothache. Like, like we all experience toothache and then we uh, 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 said, wow, if, if this terrible pain will go, go away, then I would be so relieved and so happy. Uh, but most of us don't have the toothache right now. We don't think about it, right? So to, to, to really to be mindful, like you said, to pay attention or use happiness grounding or to pay attention to the things that are really positive, that are really uh, worth appreciating uh, is very helpful. And I, I, I find that very helpful for, for me personally, um, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, connections and other things that you, you shared. Um, so I, I uh, am also aware that you guys may actually have better questions than I have. So I just, instead of asking more questions, I, I prepared some other questions because of time. I think I just wanted to see, let's open up uh, the floor for anyone to, to really throw out questions and, and have a chance to really interact a little bit and, and, and uh, any questions that people might have. Um, yeah, somebody raise your hand. So you could actually. Hi, um, I'm an occupational therapist working in a um, mental health uh, inpatient unit. And so yeah, I'm here. Oh, sorry. Hello. Um, and uh, I may I ask a favor first? Uh, can you go back to the PowerPoint uh, with the content of um, Finding the cleaning to self and ease the cleaning to self. Yeah, I think that's part of my question. Oh, I think it's last page. Oh, this one. 
Okay. Yes. Um, so the like in so you said in Buddhism, uh, Buddhist counseling um, to let people to realize the cause of suffering is clinging to the notion of self. And the goal is to ease the clinging to the notion of self. Um, from my own experience and my own practice, practicing, um, I realize it's very, very hard. Um, so from two aspects, one is that um, it's like in realizing the notion of self, um, like when people have Buddhism as belief, there's something to balance it is that people believe that everyone has the Buddha nature. Um, but if for a counseling session for the people does not have Buddhism as their religion or as their belief, how to avoid to go to the uh, slide down to the part of self-blaming of like low self-confidence, like people realize that uh, my suffering is all because of my greed, my anger, my ignorance. And it's, um, it, it's hard. And it's also, may, it may also break the record of uh, the counselor and the clients. That's um, a, a part of, uh, that's my question. I guess uh, if I understand right, so if, Clinging to the notion of self is a problem. If clients see it that way, they may understand as you're blaming me for holding on to this. That's why I create my own suffering. Is that right? Is there something like that? Yeah. So how to avoid like blaming them or having them blame themselves? Yeah, or if they just realize it and then realize that um, my suffering is all because my attachment to myself and uh -huh. how to avoid them go to the part of like self-blaming and yeah. uh, realize that it's my fault and then especially uh, if they are not buddhist if we are buddhist we kind of take responsibility of how we create our own suffering but if they're not buddhist they are blaming me i'm a victim and you should blame me that kind of things right yeah a very good question and i think i will answer from a few perspective the first thing is that i need to uh give a caveat this is just my own interpretation of buddhist counseling for all people here from your understanding of Buddhism, it may look totally different. What I want to do is really encourage people to start thinking Buddhism can be a model of counseling. Well, like no one has to follow any other model because we all have certain way of interpreting things and we can resonate with different people. So to answer your question, I think the first thing is client doesn't have to be Buddhist. I think one very important lesson that I learned in Buddhism is our self or mind cultivation. In our program, in training students, we all have their regular meditation practice. We all have to learn like metta, compassion, meditation. We all have to learn that when you are with client, you are not a Buddhist, you are not a counselor, you are not a Buddhist counselor. You are just a human being sitting next to another suffering human being. That connection, that empathic or compassionate attunement is the most important thing. We listen. We try to listen to in their world, in their mind, in their story, in the self. Why do they suffer? How do they suffer? Why do you blame yourself? Like, why is it so important to blame yourself? What actually happened in the past that make you that way? And we try to be with that story without just get um, dwell too much in it and lose our, our reality. We keep uh, composure, kindness, composure, and be with the person. And all the counseling, at least from my perspective, we need to speak to that person's story. For example, there's so many times people who have a lot of self-blame was actually internalized from their parents blaming them or expecting them to be very competent. And they believe that they should have done a lot of things while some of things are out of their control. So instead of blaming them or not blaming them, I think it's very important to reflect their habit, their mind of keep blaming themselves, such as, I realized that for many things that happen that doesn't go your way, your first reaction is to blame yourself. Huh, I wonder what's going on. Or, okay, 
like maybe having a conversation. Imagine that there's a third person or fly on the wall seeing our conversation. What would that person comment on this person blaming or interpretation of things? So that are uh, using like e either pointing out the pattern or using a third person perspective to help the person gain awareness to note what is actually going on, what is the mind inclination. And then a deeper level is we many times think that, oh, I'm incompetent, I'm self-blaming, like I'm not good. We thought that there may be a low self-esteem. But in psychology, we know that there is a superiority and inferiority complex. Or in Buddhism, we have a concept of clinging to superiority. Uh, my master, Venerable Hinhong, was doing counseling for a client whose mother I think uh, was seriously ill or passed away and, uh, and the client was a nurse. And the client keep blaming herself for not doing better, for not handling this or not doing that uh, earlier. And Venerable Hinong, because he's Venerable Hinong, so to say that, like I cannot say something like that, he said to the client directly, wow, you are very arrogant. You are very arrogant. Like, I'm not suggesting anyone who's saying something like that, blaming your client, okay? I'm saying different level, okay? When you have the report, when a client is a Buddhist, because so many times when we blame ourselves, we actually believe or attach a certain kind of superiority or competency. I thought that I can control everything and I can't, I didn't. So I blame myself and blaming myself give me an illusion of control over things. Sometimes it could be an error, though. but that is uh, later and other like based on conditions of uh, of uh, of uh, intervention, but for me, it would be the earlier one that I told you. More reflection, showing how first this is the way the habit of your cycle of your little samsara repeating certain kind of pattern. Second, seeing the suffering in that. Third, finding is there other choices like what made you do that? What is the motivation? And now you know that it brings you suffering. That what may be the other way of thinking or doing things? And are you willing to try? Are you willing to, deep inside your heart, make a decision to try to change? So those may be some of the things that I would do. Thank you. We have quite an audience online here. It's been very active throughout the, the talk. Um, and we have people who I've been logging in from uh, around the world. So uh, let me present a question from user name one. And her question is, this two part, part question. The first part is, in your experience, what are the healing techniques of Buddhist psychology that can really help people who have serious trauma or TSD? Okay. PTSD, wow, the two talks, they both talk about trauma it must be a very important issue nowadays. To be honest, I think it's not about Buddhist counseling, not Buddhist counseling first. It's about human contact. People who are traumatized, I think most important thing is creating a safe environment, to be patient, to be slow, to help them feel secure first. No matter what kind of counseling you're doing, for me, is the most important thing. And in, if more specifically for Buddhist counseling, this is a kind of like a, 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 a tricky situation. Supposedly, when we teach mindfulness, samadhi, if the mind is strong enough, it can actually ground it and then less impacted by all the traumatic memories. But to stack it, it can be very dangerous because you can actually make them become more aware, more entitled to all those kind of traumatic memories. So usually what I do for my experiences with people who have trauma is very similar to what I did with you guys. Using something like stronger. Um, there was a situation that I also shared yesterday. There was a situation that I was working with a woman who was uh, physically abused by her husband. And sometimes like she's traumatized, have some PTSD symptoms, cannot sleep well. And, and there are a few times that she even had panic attacks. And what we did was that luckily she was Buddhist. She actually know a little bit of chanting, but then she doesn't do it regularly. So we try to uh, uh, use chanting as a way. 
but she didn't be uh, she didn't chant omito for she chant om mali pam at home so what we did was that we chant together om mali pam at home i try to use my voice to synchronize with her voice to let her know that i'm being with her and we keep on chanting for like uh, five to ten minutes every session do a regular practice and i also have her do the homework of chanting more actively to consolidate her mind so that when usually when she was able to do chanting during and after feel much more peaceful and that having that kind of uh, mindful haven to protect her it was a very important starting point in the treatment to have her know that it's not every second she's bombarded by the client memory and she gets some kind of force. And for um, some other clients, uh, some of them actually, usually those who have experiences with either yoga, mindfulness or something, mindful breathing can work to a certain point, but I need to make it very careful that if I find it too intimidating, the memories come back and don't do something like that. And other clients, especially clients that the trauma was not about like physical abuse, something that triggered their body. Using sort of like a movement, just now, Bado and Chi, it was pretty helpful too. So in essence, I think the first step, building a safety environment, building a strong rapport with the counselor is important. Secondly, to start with the notes, the mindfulness building. Work with the person to see what actually works, what actually resonates with the person, and perhaps something that the person enjoy a little bit doing those will be some uh starting point and then of course for later treatments when the mind becomes stable that will be more complicated to talk about the incident and the processes in a way of uh try to try to use a more somewhat detached way third person perspective to narrate and also being able to have a mental flexibility to help them see like inside the role inside the role of a of a victim what happened and also the role what happened to see whether we can generate new perspective to the trauma, but then that also needs to be very skillful because it can be very tricky. It can re-traumatize the client. So it's not something that we can just talk directly like that, but in essence, the first two are the most important thing to build a foundation. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, we have a question from one of our professors, uh, Professor Tom Moritz says hello. And hello. his question for you, is can you please discuss your applications of Buddhist mindfulness, uh, how your, uh, your application of Buddhist mindfulness apply to alcohol and drug addictions? Wow, it's similar to uh, Dr. Shea's question. Uh, this, this morning, I was thinking of a few questions and those are the same questions I suggested for uh, Dr. Lee. But well, glad you might think alike then. Okay, so I will jump to the midst of that. I have a technique called mind moment analysis. Mind moment analysis. Like I said, every mind moment, every moment, we are actually subtly making decisions, but we are not aware of that. In situation of addiction, we have certain kind of craving, we want that, we have certain kind of urge that we don't have much more pulse. We don't have much more awareness of how our mind, our speech, our behavior actually perpetrate certain kind of behavior again and again. So theoretically, what happened is we try to train clients' mind using mindfulness, like we have to talk about, so that the person will be able to realize more different trigger points. Um, for example, I don't know if you're aware of when you were angry, when you have an urge or when you're anxious, usually there is a trigger point. Usually, the trigger point is a perception, not per perception per se in cognitive psychology, but the perception in the five aggregates. We have form, we have feeling, we have perception, right? Something happened in the reality, we have a reaction, a feeling, and then the perception is a very important turning point to determine what happened next, because there's a perception, pretty automatic, and then the I, I-ness, rise up, to form a relation with that. I want it, I hate it, and all the crazy things happen afterwards. If we can slow down people's mind, if we can train them to be more mindful, slower, be more aware of how things happen, then we can help them see, are there any breakout points? Are there any choice points that they can do something different? For example, 
uh, when we do uh, DBT, they have some very good interventions too, right? But then those skills, they rely on the training analysis, whether you can see the breakout point in between them and the person can choose mindfully to implement those skills, like grounding or certain kind of self-reflections or wise mind, those kind of things. So I think in essence is, can we actually help the person first develop a foundation in mind first? Second, using all those life experiences, critical incidences of using substance and see what are actually the trigger point. What was the thought? What was the thought right before you choose to use the substance? What was the time? What was the perception right before you have the urge? So when people are able to be aware of those things, that wisdom can culminate for the next time they are being more aware, next time being more aware. And when they accumulate the wisdom, and then it will become much more clear about the choice point and they can make something different. They can make a different choice. So something like that, theoretical. Wonderful, yeah. Um, I could also just briefly comment. I, I think, again, like people says, trauma and addictions are huge problems, uh, both in the, the client population, but also just, just general population for everybody. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, as you said, you know, having a sense of safety is so important first, and then, and even the, some sense of safety dealing with all the, the the internal experiences that we have as well. Um, uh, for example, so much of it seems that so much of our uh, mental health problems, whether we're talking about mood problems or addiction, is often a a interaction of of some of our maybe biological vulnerabilities, as well as environmental things, as well as uh, personal vulnerabilities. And, and often there's a kind of a lot of bi-directional transactions, right? So, so um, just using sleep as a quick example, when, when we're very stressed, uh, uh, sometimes we don't sleep very well, right? And when we don't sleep well, it affects our mood as well and it makes us more anxious and irritable and maybe we don't uh, also function as well in, in certain challenges or, or demands at work at home and it sometimes can make things worse what we're dealing with become more stress for us and it's just a cycle so i think what i believe dr lee mentioned a little bit earlier when you're showing about the some of the these mm, different strategies to to at least uh sort of not creating the, the additional second arrow part, right? So, because we can focus maybe on the things that we have control of that can at least make things a little bit better and not make things worse. So if we engage in certain behavior, we know, is it helping us? If it's not helping us, then we try to, again, have that knowledge and try it our best to, to find different ways to, maybe at least take a, a interrupt that, that vicious cycle that often is so common in addiction or even in uh, different, uh, different maladaptive behavior related to different mood issues. But sorry, I, I'm gonna let audience ask more questions. There are a lot more questions on the internet. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lee, for the uh, wonderful presentation on your uh, book and your Not Not Choose. Uh, I would like to have learned uh, very, uh, from you 
about the technique at Hong Kong U. And uh, I would like to know that what about your clinical trials? How, what are the outcome? Have you done enough uh, clinical trial with this technique? And what are the outcomes? So uh, we're still on the process of doing different clinical trials. And um, it's interesting that, of course, we measure uh, regular psychosocial measures like stress or like patient health questionnaires. But my favorite is actually the uh, non-attachment scale, which is, I think, one of the closest validated scale to Buddhism. It measures how less attached people are. And the result is most of the trials we have done, people decrease the most in the non-attachment scales. I think this is actually something uh, uh, very meaningful to me because I think sometimes if we are doing Buddhist counseling, it's important that we have developed certain kind of inventories that is actually more relevant to Buddhist teaching. Of course, that should correlate with uh, traditional psychological inventories. Well, like I think the attachment scale capture how we are actually sharing Buddhist teaching so that people do not have to hold so tight onto their thoughts, onto their feelings, you know, who they are, so that they can be somewhat more liberated. And uh, other than that, uh, our qualitative feedback are usually pretty good. But of course, all the research are a little biased. We cannot capture the feedback from people we dropped out, right? And um, for people who actually uh, come to Buddhist counseling, one thing they really appreciate is actually learning the Buddhist worldview. Even though many clients actually are not Buddhist, they are atheistic, or even some of them are Catholic. But then just understanding that perspective and using that perspective to understand their life, they find it very fascinating. So that's why I find this kind of work very meaningful because um, I don't think I am spreading out our religion and forcing people to be Buddhist. But what I try to do is I want to show there can be another perspective to see yourself, the world, and suffering. And hopefully, if you find it helpful, if you find it something that can make you suffer less, then let's try and see. Just like the to the Kalama Sutta, right? The Buddha said, do not just go by the legends, the report, the rituals, and rites. Also experience for yourself. If it works, then practice it. So I think this is the attitude I use. Thank you, Venerable. Yeah, and we're, we're so honored to have many venerable here also in attendance. And uh, so many of you have so, so much uh, you know, knowledge and, and deep practice. I wonder if there's any, uh, any, uh, any input that any of you would, would be open to share uh, related to the topic of how, you know, how to uh, maybe to have come out of some of the, the pain and suffering and have, have more uh, well-being. Uh, in the, the normal struggles that people have. If, if... Thank you. This is just a comment. I'm a volunteer. I volunteer in California state prisons for the past 10 years, both men and women. And similar to some of the, I'm not a therapist. <laughs> I'm just a monk. And, and a lot of the, the work that I do, the practices, the teaching of the Buddha, are very similar to what uh, Dr. Lee uh, has talked about. Um, and, and as you guys know, 100% of the popula incarcerated population suffer different forms of trauma from childhood to being bullied, to affiliated with gang members, to with having addictions. So the, the as we looked at the borders, like, you know, people who can they will all suffer trauma. And, and that's that prose that I used as I bring Buddhism into the prisons. I just want to let you guys know. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable D. You know, I always have a lot of admiration for Venerable D and Professor Lancaster go to the prison to teach Buddhism and meditation. And to be honest, I think usually people have a lot of fear in going in that situation. But what I see in them is that our fear is worse than our reality. What I found is that the inmates are usually the best students and the best meditators. I'm sorry, sorry for the NBC and US students. They, you should... they are. They are. 
Yeah, that really reminds us of we have a lot of precious things. Can we take it actually more preciously to practice? And so many times because of our own hindrances and defilements, we stop ourselves from engaging with other people. And when we are able to use our compassion, the composure and confidence that Venerable D have, we get in touch with others. The outcome can be very unexpected. So I really humbly want to learn more from you and Professor Lancaster about that. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know, it, I think you're absolutely, uh, you know, the the uh, there's so much uh, people. Most people with addiction issue usually have trauma. That's what we find and feel. Just vast majority, and uh, and I I think that oftentimes people are really hungry for some tools and some ways to really suffer less. Right, and especially people in the depths of those suffering. Um, so it's it's really wonderful that that you're able to bring uh, Buddha's teaching and having some practical ways to help people. Um, and I think the other thing with trauma is that a lot of time, you know, it, it, these trauma experiences shatter their whole world in some ways, uh, people that they trust and all that. And in in many ways, they're also part of the recovery sometimes is to search for meaning, is to find a way for things to make sense, to recreate the world in some ways. So having some really, uh, really, uh, you know, good ways to understand that maybe the reality and their experiences, uh, perhaps from Buddha's teaching and, and, and could be potentially really helpful for that particular aspect as well. Thank you. Okay, so in the interest of time, uh, this will be the last question, and I apologize to the audience uh, on Zoom. Uh, we won't get to some of your questions, but the final question will go to will come from the newest member of our faculty, Dr. Joanne Kuo, and says, "Quote, Dr. Lee, I always joke that I can only prescribe meditation and exercise, but do you think?" that to tell a patient that you just need to sleep well, eat well, and connect to others can come across as non-validating or minimizing. <laughs> Do you think that when it comes from our Buddhist perspective, a health-seeking patient or potential client can accept that approach better as compared to in a Western psycho psychotherapy setting? That's an inter interesting question. Question. I usually don't just tell people that eat well, sleep well, and you will be better. Usually I don't do it directly. It just come across this way. I think usually when I see a client, there are a few questions that I will ask. The first one is, how is your regular day like? What do you do when you wake up to now? What do you do? The second thing is, what do you like doing? What do you enjoy doing? Most of the time when I see a client, when they come into my office, they start talking about all the things that are worrying them, they're anxious about, they're angry about, almost like no gap. Some of them can go on and on for a long time. And maybe it's very difficult because no one is there willing to listen to them. Nowadays, people don't listen that much. I don't know how to emphasize more on the power of listening. You know, many of us are Buddhist and for all the Buddhist Dathra that I like, of course, my favorite is Guan Yin, Abu Glo, Kiddishvara. She devotes her expertise in listening. Listening is not that simple. So many times we are just hearing things. We don't actually care what the other person said. Sometimes we selectively listen to things that interest us and we selectively respond. Not so many times that we are willing to come out from our perspective to really care about how is the world like in that person. And this time it's really accepting, non-judgmental, just seeing how is it like for their suffering, what is going on, what actually burdened them, what actually make them feel so bad. Sometimes we just don't agree with their way of decisions or thinking, but that's not the point. It's not about us. No matter how much we know, we still need to have some kind of not knowing mind to go into that situation. No matter how much we try to conceptualize and hypothesize, we need to understand that we cannot know everything so that the cup is always half empty so that 
when that happens, we feel connected. And just by that connection, we make them feel they are being heard, they are being understood, someone cares, someone is with them. And many times, just with that attunement, it actually helps the person have some improvement. We are all strong, intelligent people. For all the clients I've seen, they have all of them have their wise and beautiful side. But most of them do not have someone who is willing to understand them deeply. So I will not come in and say, eat better and sleep better. And well, I think there's some, uh, some cultural differences in the Asian culture, seeing Asian clients. When they see people like us, like sitting in this kind of chair, dressing like that, oh, you're a doctor, you give me advice, I'll do something, and I uh, hopefully I feel better. Yes, there are some cultural inferences. But that should never override our ability to listen without ourselves. When you really talk to someone, it doesn't matter who you are in a way, because you are totally immersed, using yourself only as a tool to immerse in that situation. And then wisdom arrives. You will decide whether you, whether that person actually can benefit from eating better or sleeping better. Of course, this is just an uh, overarching word. Eat better, sleep better. This is not so easy, right? So again, if I would uh, end with one thing, try to put down all the knowledge, all the self or attachment, or all the needs to prove ourselves or anything that we have when we are with a person. The only thing that matters is the person's suffering. Sometimes students ask me, well, I don't want to see that patient. The trauma is horrible. Or I don't want to see that client. That, that is just, I mean, like, their family died. They are crying. I don't know what to do. It would trigger so many things in me. And there are times that even I feel confused. I don't know what to do. I wish that I know what to do. I blame myself. I should do better. And in all those moments, only one thing that I did, look into the person's eyes to feel, to let our hearts open and feel what is going on in the person. And every time, never disappoint me, every time when there's a connection, then we, me and the client, know what to do. So that's the final sharing that I have. Thank you. Once again, I want to thank you, Dr. Shea, Dr. Lee, for sharing this valuable time with us today. Um, I myself learned so much, particularly no one size fit all. Um, and I think with the uh, Buddhist wisdom and philosophy that have been existing for thousands of years, um, where um, our Asian American, Asian um, family have not been using psychology, uh, psychologists for so many, so many years, but they survive. Um, I, I attribute to the venerable, um, the services uh, in the temples uh, where I have seen many of our families seek um, refuge, seek advice um, from monk um, in the temple uh, for many of this mental issue. Um, but I, I surely believe that with the integrating with uh, Buddhist wisdom and philosophy, we can enhance our psychological practices. And it, this country, the emphasis of diversity, the emphasis of integrating. So I think um, it's about time that we need to bring this um, topic forefront, upfront, um, to be more inclusive of how we can um, create a system where all everyone is included. Um, and there are different methods of helping people from different walk of life and different cultures. And I think Buddhist counseling um, is one way, uh, one of the best practice uh, for um, helping our Asian Americans or even open up um, the, the field of psychology in Asia, which for longest time um, got was not accepted. Um, so that's my final word. And thank you so much uh, for all the audience who are being here today and for all the participants online. Thank you for um, coming. And thank you, Dr. Lee and Dr. Shea again for your valuable time.
Thank you.